In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We'll continue in the book of Song of Songs. I really do not want this book to end from how beautiful it is. Um, and just to kind of, kind of go to review where we are, we spoke about the relationship and the stage of the spiritual life. And we said initially, the soul will get initial grace from God. She feels loved. She responds, and after a while, she, because of negligence and ignorance, she kind of sometimes loses that grace. Then she searches for God, finds Him again, and then the second time, God actually comes to her at an unexpected time. She's not ready to obey Him at an unexpected time. So then He leaves. When He leaves, she runs after him and she learns how valuable he is and how important he is to her life. He's not just uh, an addition to her life or something nice to have. She understands now that he became all her life. And in the last stage that she had become married and she become committed. What we have noticed throughout the book is that the way that God speaks about the human soul has not changed. He speaks about the human soul the same way from day one until she was perfected. It's like a father who loves his daughter or his son the same way regardless where they are in their spiritual life. And God already sees us with the eyes of eternity, with the eyes of how we would be with him billions and billions of years from today. This is how God looks at us. Last time, we saw how God was speaking to the, we said the soul at the end of the book, her name became clear, her name is the Shulamite, which is the feminine of Solomon. So she became, she realized that she's the image of God. The pride, the groom is the king of peace, and the pride is the feminine of peace. That's her image. Last week we continue to see how the Lord speaks to the human soul. We're in chapter 7, verse 9. We'll just finish that, and then we'll see how the soul responded. This is God speaking. He says, And the roof of your mouth, like the best wine. What is the roof of the mouth? It's usually the voice. And in Psalm 15, 23, it says, A man has joy by answer of his mouth, and a word is spoken in due season, how good it is. So God says, the voice that comes from you is like the best wine. What is the best wine for us? We think of the best wine or the new wine as the gospel. And you see it in the, in the gospel of Mark when it says, when the Lord in the Last Supper, he says, Surely I say unto you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So the Eucharist we take is one level, but there is new wine in the kingdom of heaven. When you look at this verse, you feel God is talking about a mix between a kiss and a whisper. It's images that the human cannot understand. And be careful because the whole, a lot of, one of, one of the words that's repeated a lot is like. Like wine, like this, like that. Because it's really hard to explain exactly what is it the lord speaks as much as he can to express how much he loves each part of us god each part of you he cares about your eyes your head your feet we saw last time the lord praised her from the sandals up now, the human soul, once she heard all this, this is toward the end of her perfection, she said, the wine goes down smoothly for my beloved, moving gently the lips of sleepers. I am my beloved's and his desire is toward me. His desire is toward me. The idea of his desire toward me shows how strongly she trusts now that God loves her and cares for her and he has all her focus on her remember there's a difference between our 
beliefs that are stuck in our thoughts and the beliefs that are in our hearts. If I believe that God is around all the time, all the time, my action and my life will be different. But she did realize it's not a matter of like God is just around. God's desire is toward me. You know, in the Psalm, Psalm 139, look at what it says in Psalm 139. It says, How precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sands. When I awake, I am still with you. You know, like when you have a situation that happens at work or at school, or like you're waiting for great to come, and then what happens, like your thoughts is consumed with the breakup of the relationship or with the interview or whatever it is, this is how God is with us, consumed with us. Do you believe that? I can't believe it because I don't love myself the way that God loves me. Not even close. And he says, she says here, she says, he's like a wine that's causing the sleep to speak. You know, this is, reminds us of the first miracle, because tomorrow is the feast of Jesus Christ's first miracle of turning water into wine. People in this world did not realize that he's the Christ. And those who are sleeping in their sins started to speak. Where did the swine come from? Who brought this in? People who live in darkness started to praise God. The Bible revived those who are dying under the law. Look at what St. Paul said in Romans 7. He says, I was alive once without a law. I was alive without a law. But when the commandments came, sin revived and I died. And then the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. When I found the law, the law showed me my weakness. Showed me how far away from God. I realized that I'm living in death. Death. God made, she's telling him, your wine, your gospel, your words have made those who are asleep wake up. Why? Because his desire is toward you and me. When I stand and pray, I'm not offering love. I'm responding to love. I'm not telling God, I love you. I'm telling him, I love you too. Because he already initiated the love. Look what she tells him. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Where is, where is the field? The fields are usually in the countryside. But with God, what happens in our initial life? We start producing fruits. Fruit of the spirits. What is the greatest fruit that we produce? Love. So she's telling him, come to the field let us enjoy the fruit of love that was produced by the Spirit in me. Let us fall in love. Different than initial her life, early part of her life. I remember a while ago, I was on a mission trip in Africa, and we had with us an elderly couple from Chicago, a doctor and his wife. And this doctor, actually, he had a stroke and he can't see very well. They're probably, at that time when we went there, probably in their 70s, maybe. So I remember when we went to the zoo at the end, like him and his wife were walking, holding hands. And all the, obviously all the kids behind them, oh, that's so cute, you know, the whole, they left the zoo and they followed the couple, <laughs> watching them holding hands of how beautiful this couple is. The beautiful thing about them, the, this person, the, the man in the relationship, he, he's, a good, he does, he's a good servant, he gives very wonderful sermons. But because he can't see very well, 
A lot of times he would recite verses in the Bible he has memorized. When he forgets a verse, his wife knows exactly what verse he wants to say and he would tell him the verse and he would recite it. You see, this is just a, a glimpse of the perfection of love. She's telling him, let's go. She's preparing old and new fruits. Remember, the, all the fruits that God gives us pushes us to have new. That's why we talk about the, the spiritual life as seasons. This season I produce fruit, the season I produce more. The third one better, fruits. It's a constant fruit of love. The soul is not closed, but wants to share. One of the fathers um, was telling me this story about <clears throat> one of the monastic fathers. This father, as he was reading the scripture, he started getting a lot of beautiful meditation on the Bible. So he decided not to share these meditations. He said, you know what, I'll keep them for myself and I'll share them when I have a big group of people to share it with. But he said when he did this, the Spirit closed his heart and his mind. But once he realized that these are fruits that he has to share, the Spirit started to give him much more. Much more. The fruits that God gives us, it is for me to share with the Lord and with His church. And we'll see this clearly as we move on. And she's telling him, let's go to the villages. By the way, the villages are a beautiful place because they are far away from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is where all the noise and all the trade and all the haste and all that stuff. She's telling him, let's go what? To, let's, I'm willing to leave my home so I can stay with you. Every time I break a detachment, I'm telling God, let's lodge in the villages. I'm willing to give up food so I can spend more time with you. I'm willing to give up video game and phones and music and distraction and this and this so I can spend more time with you. She's telling him what? Let us get up early to the vineyards. She's the one who's in it, talking. You remember earlier God was like, come with me, follow the foot. Look at her, she's like on fire. Let us get up early to the vineyard. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether the grape blossom, blossoms are open and the pomegranates are in the bloom. There I will give you my love. She's telling him, let's go early. The soul that really is, becomes perfected in its love for God becomes so eager to grow with God. One of the signs that people are, are walking in the path of perfect, perfection that they do not delay the acts of love. Those who do not delay their prayer, do not delay giving their tithe, do not delay forgiving people. I remember there is a, a beautiful holy man I have met in, at some point and one of the stories that touched me, he was an engineer and he had a company under him. He made one person upset. He could not let an hour go without going back to reconcile. This is really what God is saying. He's saying, she's telling God, look, I can't wait. There's this new faithfulness that it's born at the perfection state. Faithfulness that can only be consumed by the Lord. There's, there is an assurance that this person will be diligent. Look at what, said, what it says in Galatians 6.10. It says, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Whenever there's an opportunity, the soul is ready to offer. And this soul understand what does it mean to love. I was actually uh, in the monastery with the youth last week, and one of the fathers said a beautiful story. He said, 
there is a convert uh, to the Christian faith and she was living relatively very modest so when the priest visited her before Lent she told him can you bring me one can of beans and one bag of bread so he told her what about why don't I bring you a whole box of beans and a whole box of bread to last you longer she told him no you misunderstand what this ascetic life is ascetic life or fasting is not that I have abundance whenever I'm hungry I eat it's I have little whenever I'm hungry I pray so God can bring me food the fruit that comes of perfection I want everything to be related to my relationship with God we're talking about um, a love that you might not might not understand at, the, at this point we are in but at least shows us where the soul is going she says the men, uh, the mandorcas give off a fragrance, and at our gates, and at our gates are pleasant fruits, all manner, new and old, which I have laid up for you, my beloved. So she's really, really telling him, "Come, see the fruits I'm giving you. See what I have. Is it enough? I want to show love. I want to give more." Her main concern is to give. I was just reading a beautiful quote yesterday. I really liked. One of the Western saints, she was saying that perfection is not about consolation, but it's about love. The path of perfection with God is not about every two minutes I get like a vision, so I feel like God loves me, or I get a miracle, or I feel like I feel a certain feeling, or you know somebody gives me a word that makes me feel I'm, I'm full of light. She said it's not about consolation. It's about love. So she's really excited to show love. And the uh, mandarax, the uh, a Hebrew for a certain type of plant, which means to love. And actually it's a Mediterranean plant of a nightshade family. And they use it to think about a marriage between man and woman. So she's telling him, come, let us sit under the shade of a married woman and a husband so we can show each other share each other love and she's telling him at our gate at our gates are pleasant present fruit remember the word the gates were really meant for the summer house and if, remember a couple of a couple of bible studies ago we talked about how the summer period in our life we call it the school of the saints so she's telling him, come, let us go to my summer house where I have laid so many fruits for you. That's why in First Titus, First Timothy says, what command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for a coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The soul have died so she can become fruitful. She's confident that in of the meeting with her beloved and all her life, she's preparing nice fruit for that day. You know, if, if I ask you and me today, if I am meeting the Lord, what would I offer him? I don't want you to think of it as the sense, sometimes when we think of about this, we think about it in a more depressive way. You know, like, I have done nothing, I'm a failure. That's not the meaning. But if I love somebody so much, and it's my wedding day, what, what would I like to show offer out of love? Not out of fear, not out of, like, force, but out of true love for God. Now, we'll start chapter 8. And chapter 8 is really, really about service. And I, will, I want you to notice something as we go through this. 
is that chapter 8 brings a humongous shift in the book. All the book until chapter 7, she talks about her relationship with, what? with the Lord. Now she's going to talk about her relationship as a servant of the whole church. Because once you love God so, so much, so, so much, there's no other choice but to serve. Obviously, the problem is most of us serve before loving God so much. So that causes, obviously, some problems uh, to some people. But here, she's starting to serve after she loved him so much. She said, oh, that you are like my brother. This is weird, right? Because we talked about some people who look at this book as a literal, even though he's using the word like a lot. But she says, Oh, that you are like my brother, who nursed at my mother's breast. If I should find you outside, I would kiss you. I would not be despised. So, now we're starting to think about more about service. But then she's saying, Oh, that you are like my brother. What is that really referring to? Remember, the Lord, earlier in the book of Song of Songs, he referred to her as his sister. Okay? And when, when did this happen, that the human soul became brother and sisters of the Lord in the Incarnation? That's why St. Paul mentioned in Romans, he says what? For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to his image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So how does she, when does she enjoy him as a brother? is in the Incarnation. And by the way, this call was also hidden in the Old Testament. If you look in Isaiah 64, 1, it says, Oh, that you would render the heavens, that you would come down. Even in the prophets in the Old Testament, they really had in their mind that God would come down one day. This is a wish. You think of it as a prophet who is praying and wishing for that, and the Lord achieved this in uh, in in incarnation. Now she said, look here, she's telling him, who nursed at my mother's breast, if I, sh if, I, if I should find you outside, I would kiss you, I would not be despised. What does this mean? In the time of Israel, if the time of Palestinian, and actually in the time of the Lord, a married couple would not be able to walk next to each other on the street. And actually, if you live in Egypt and you have some of the older grandparents, the older generation, much older generation, if you've had a glimpse of them, I remember a couple very well, that you'd walk and go into the church, you meet the husband, and then five minutes later you meet the wife. They would never walk together in what? In public even if they are married. But what is she telling him? Look here, she says, if I find you outside, I would kiss you and I would not be despised. Like she's not breaking the social norm that she's going eh, beyond. Like, if I find you outside in the street, it's not like I'm going to walk next to you, I will kiss you and I will not be eh, despised. So what is she talking about here? She's telling him, when you are incarnated, I will speak about you in public. There will be no shame in love. They will persecute me. They will humiliate me. They will mistreat me. I do not care. You know, this verse reminds us of the woman who washed the feet of Christ. And this is not my own actual interpretation. This is St. Athanasius. He said this. Uh, he says, although... Very many were praying for his coming and saying, or oh, that the salvation of God would come out of, of Zion. The spouse also, as it's written in the Song of Songs, was praying and saying, or oh, that you are like a brother to me, that nurse at my mother's breast. And the meaning of this prayer is this, or oh, that you are like humanity and would take on human nature for our sake. After all, it was God who set up times and seasons and he knows our needs better than we do because he loves us he exhorts us to do the right thing at the right time so that we may be healed. Thus, when the appropriate time had come, the Father sent 
the Son, just as he promised. This is St. Athanasius. So the church, and by the way, this is what historically happened. The church broke every social norm in preaching the Lord Christ. Then she's telling him, I would lead you and bring you into the house of my mother, she who used to instruct me. I would cause you to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. What is, what is the, the mother, the, her mother's house? Is a church. We're born from the womb of the church. And if you guys, as mentioned before, the baptism room has two doors. One when you enter from the world and one that's open to the church. You're born into the church through baptism. The soul cannot enjoy its faith outside the church. And actually we were reading a book recently and the book said something interesting. He said there are two aspects of faith. There is a doctrine, there is also the sense of belonging. So when we are in a church, we develop the bond of belonging, the element of faith that is so critical. And she's talking about how the church used to instruct her. And if actually you look at the book of, um, of Proverbs, uh, of book of Psalms, I don't want to go, I don't want to emphasize this idea a lot, but you can see the progress. When she started, the soul was introduced to the Lord, but she was attached to the world. She just desired to make him joyful. Okay? But later on, this was in, uh, this was in uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Later on in chapter 3, verse 7, she loved him a lot, but she fell into lukewarmness. Now she's acting as a suffering servant. She's suffering for the sake of God. She's telling him here, uh, I would cause you to drink of spiced wine off the juice of my pomegranate. The juice of pomegranate is a symbol of suffering. Pomegranate is very red, reminds us. Wine, uh, spiced wine, reminds us of the offering of the Lord. So she's telling him, I want you to drink of what I've been offering. Now she's telling him, his left hand is under my head and his right hand embraces me. By the way, this verse was mentioned twice, but there's a big difference. The first time she mentioned this verse was in chapter 2, and she's talking more about the initial grace, when you feel excited and feel God is with you and all that stuff. This time, it's more like an eternal hug. It's not a momentary moment where I feel, oh, God is close. This is, now she feels this all the time. That's why in 2 Corinthians said, For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds to Christ. For she understands that He's hugging her as she caring and suffering for the sake of everybody else. She's telling them here, I charge you, O daughter of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Again, these are same verses repeated, but with different levels of spirituality. Earlier, she was more like, I want to keep God for myself. I don't want to lose the happiness and the grace and the joy that I'm getting the consolation. But now it's different. Now there's a full trust in her relationship with God that she is in his bosom throughout the whole time. It's like the book about practicing the presence of God or the way of the pilgrim or those people who are able to enjoy God all the time. All the time. Now it looks like some sort of relative or people around or maybe the daughter of Jerusalem saying, who is the coming, who is this coming from the wilderness, leaning upon her, her beloved? I awakened you under the apple tree. There your mother brought you forth. There she who bore you brought you forth. Remember the same exact verse the Lord said about the human soul. Who said, he said, who is this coming out of the wilderness? Now people, when they see her, they say, who is this coming out of the wilderness? It's like now, the, what the Lord praised in the human soul has become clear to the world. 
The hidden fruit have been recognized. The hidden life have been revealed. And he says, I awakened you under the tree. The tree is the church. And the soul referred to the Lord as apple. So we all become his image in the church. As it says in Ephesians, for you are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The world saw us ruined earlier and broken under the tree in Genesis. Now she sees the human soul restored with so much beauty under the apple tree of the cross. That's why St. Jerome said, who is that that comes up cleansed and leaning upon her beloved so that she indeed is cleansed, but she's not able to guard her purity unless she's sustained by the Lord God. So St. Jerome is saying, she realized that her purity is only sustained by how close she is to God. So she's serving, but she's bonding to God. Okay? Look here. Now, this is what the Shulamite heard from people. She heard people talking about her, but what did she do? Look at her response. Did she look at the people praising her? Oh. What did she say? She goes back to talk to her beloved. She says, sit me as a seal upon your heart. This is, this is what happens when the soul becomes so close to God that when she hears praise, it doesn't even fade her. A humble person is not impacted by dishonor or honor. He's neutral in all cases. Why? Because his love and his energy and everything is toward the Lord. She's telling him, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. Jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flame are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. By the way, if you look at the original translation, it talks about its flame are flame of fire, this is the first time it actually mentioned God. It's talking about Jehovah's fire. So it's the first time where this verse actually, the book refers to God himself. But so we'll go through it slowly by slowly. What is tell him, set me as a seal upon your heart. How do people used to make seals in the old days? They would take a wax, heat it up to a very high temperature, and stamp it, and place it, and seal it. So what is she asking? Well, first she's asking that she wants to be purified with the greatest fire of love. You know, like, a lot of times in our spiritual life, early on, when we are in tribulation or difficult time, we complain. But the people who are live, lived with God a lot, they realize that this fire were a reason for them to love God more. They have learned to ask for more purification. And then she's asking that she become as a seal, she's asking to offer all herself. I want all of me to be melted. And then what is she saying? She says, seal it, put it a seal on your heart. That means no one can wipe my name. It means that I have a secret relationship with God. She wants, she wants herself to be the closest thing to his heart. That's what she wants. If I ask you and myself, what are our spiritual desires? Oh, I want humility, I want kind, I want to, I want to... I want, she says, I want to melt under next to your heart. I want to love you like nobody else have loved you. In the, in the old days, obviously, when you, put a, when you put a seal, each person used to have a stamp. So you put it in the wax, and then you stamp. And that stamp usually would have the image of the person. That's why 
when the prodigal son came back, they give him the ring. The ring is actually a stamp. So she's telling him, I want to be a reflection of your own image. And then she said, seal on the arm. The arm represents, the right arm especially represents the work. So she's telling him, basically, I want to be your, your right hand person. Anything you want, I would love to do it. Whatever makes you happy, whatever service, anything like that, I would love to do it. You can think about this, when God himself says, you know what, I have plans, but should I hide it from Abraham? And God talks to Abraham, like, Abraham, I'm planning to bring down Sedem and Gomorrah. What do you think? It's crazy. They become the go-to person. Moses, the Bible says, God spoke to Moses as a man speak to his friend. That's just, wow. That's a different world than where we live in. She's telling him, love as strong as death. Why death? Because you cannot control death. She wants to love him to the point that she cannot control herself. Death is the reality that we all will face. And in the old days, actually, it was thought death to be the to be one of the, the, basically the strongest force. St. Augustine said, when death comes, it cannot be resisted. By whatever art, whatever medicine you meet, the violence of death can none avoid who is born mortal. So against the violence of love, can the world do nothing? For from the country of the similitude, it is made of death. For as death is most violent to take away, so love is most violent to save. Through love, many have died to the world to live to God. That's what Augustine said. Only God can defeat death by his love. This is the, most, the only powerful force than death. That's why in John 10, 15, it says, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. God invites us to a power that can defeat death. Not only the physical death, but all our internal death. We are called, all of us, to something very similar. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 9, 60. He says, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of heaven. Obviously, she says, Jealousy as cruel as the grief. The feeling that God is worried, no, I'm just talking for human sense right now. Obviously, God does not share our feelings in a sense, we share our feelings, but he relates to us. But she says, if God is jealous for a human soul, I would not be content to see him jealous and I do nothing. Like imagine if you have like your brother or sister, your husband or your wife, and somebody's bothered him or something that's causing them trouble and you love them so much, you'd be like, I, I, what, what can I do? Let me, let me what, what you, need, you need me to do and I'll do it. She says, I cannot see him jealous or caring or worried about something and it's as cool as the grief. Once you go in, you cannot come out. This is, this is expressions of love that like it expresses a stage of life that many people die without even seeing it. Many Christians die without seeing it. She says, it's flame or flames of fire. The fire flame of Jehovah. 
This is obviously it's telling you, first time in the book God is mentioned. And you see this in the book of Psalm 69, 9 says, Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproach of those who reproach you have fallen on me. She become jealous for the church. Jealous for every person around her. And then this fire that we receive is the word of God. Like the Lord said in Luke 12, 49, he says, I came to send fire on earth. And how I wish it were already kindled. This is what God said. If I let God's word penetrate my heart, I will be on fire. And the other fire that we know of is what happened in the Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit came as tongues of fire. And this is what happens with the human soul. Once it subjected itself to the greatest perfection of, of love, it becomes like the apostles, willing to preach, willing to die, willing to sacrifice, willing to give. And not as a, and not as a, as a generous offer from it, but it's a response to the love of the Lord. Look what she says. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing book. She says, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. What is she saying? She's saying, if God comes and tells me, look, I want you to give your bank account, your car, your house for me today. She says, it will be utterly despised. Garbage. Take it. Can you imagine? She says, the waters of this world cannot quench the true love for God. What is the water of this world? Lust, richness, persecution, pleasure. If the love of God is ignited inside my heart, nothing can quench it. And the book of Revelation says, So the serpent spewed water out of its mouth, like a flood after the woman, that she might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed it up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of its mouth. Even when the devil has its most power, it cannot quench love. Look what she says here. She says, she says, nothing short of God himself would keep me satisfied. Nothing short of God himself would keep me satisfied. Now, look what happened. The brothers of the Shulamite, or the, the, he, the soul, they told her, we have a little sister. And she has no breast. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she's spoken for? What does it mean, sister without a breast? You guys remember we talked earlier about the concept of the breast is a concept of nourishment. That's the only source of good nourishment that the ancient world knows. Real good nourishment. Nothing would replace this for a child. So he's saying, we have a sister who does not have this nourishment. Who is it that the sister that does not have this nourishment? It's the non-Jewish, the people who do not believe in God. Those who were never introduced to the Bible. But she's saying, I don't know what to do, what to do for her. She does not know God. See how the switch happened in the book of Song of Songs? Earlier, it's all about her relationship with God. She moved into, even when people talk to her, she's just her and God. Now, she started ending the book with being concerned about those who do not know. After she said, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Love is, uh, cannot be quenched by many water. Because her love for God made her love truly to serve. So here she says, this older sister is saying, I have a sister who is not close to God. This is different by the way in the story of the prodigal son of what the older brother did. So she said, what we'll do when she gets married? 
What happened to the sister when the day, when the day comes when God calls her? You know, this is how we all feel for all those people who are not, who do not know God yet. Look what the groom said. Listen to what he says. He says, if she is a wall, we will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. First of all, I want, you to, I want to show you a couple of things. When she started praying for the church or for those who are far away from God, the response came immediate. She's in love for God. She told him, I have a sister and she doesn't know you yet. What should I do? He says, look, if she's a wall, I will build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she is a door, we will enclose her with the boards of cedar. What does that mean? There are two kinds of non-believers. People, people who build a wall around themselves and they reject the voice of God. God will build a tower of silver. What does it mean? Silver and gold are refined by fire. So the Lord will allow this person to be refined by fire so that his word might penetrate through. And by the way, this might seem counterintuitive to a lot of people. When somebody is rejecting God, God allows them to get into more tribulation. And then they complain. And St. Isaac says, when you complain in tribulation, God doubles the tribulation. Not because he's out there to get this person, he's out there to purify it. And look what the Bible said. He says, he will put on it a battlement of silver, not gold, because they have not reached the gold yet. He start with the silver first. They have not reached that golden st stage. It's almost like when you know you have your credit card status, silver, gold, platinum, you know. They have not reached the gold stage with the Lord yet. So those who put a wall around their hearts, God says, I will put them in fire. And a lot of times when you pray for people who have put a wall around their heart, you might find that tribulation have increased in their life. Don't be discouraged because God is working. The other kind of people, those who, who keep basically their door open to any idea. Any thought comes, anything comes. But God says, I will surround them with a wall. With wood of cedar. We said the, word of, the, the wood of cedar is tall, points up to protect them from all these thoughts that go in and out. That's why it says in Luke 5, 4, this is what the world did with Simon. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, lunge into the deep and I will let your net for, uh, uh, and let down your net for a catch. God took Simon to the deep and closed down all these noises around him so he can start tasting God. This is how God works. Be careful because when the human is so caring about people, God tells her the plan. This is what I'm going to do. So when you see it, you're not discouraged because you work for me. Now look what the Shulamite said. This is such a beautiful chapter. It's like I just did not want it to end. But what she said, she told him, you're going to build a wall? You're going to build a tower? Then what she says, she says, I am a wall and a breast, my breast like towers then I became in his eyes as one who had found peace. So what is she saying? She says, this is what you're going to do? I believe you because you have done this in my own life. I know you're capable of building a wall. I know you're capable of building a tower, tower because you have done this in my own life. But also she's saying that I am willing to be part of this plan. I am willing to be part of of to be your right hand, like she said earlier. And also, by the way, this also, we said the human soul and also presents the church. The church provides great teaching that extends for many years and reflects the spirituality of the giants of, of, of faith. And then she's telling him, look, uh, as one who has found peace, the church gives peace and also reconciles people with God. This is almost the vow that the church is making. 
I will create peace between people and the Lord. Then it says Solomon had a vineyard at Bel Hamun. He leased the vineyard to keepers. Everyone was, was to bring for its fruits a thousand silver coins. The word Bel Hamun is equivalent to the owner of the multitude. In Solomon's, Solomon's day, it was a very fruitful hill. You can read about it in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 20. So the Lord became a groom and gave the vineyard to the church. Be careful. The Lord did not sell the vineyard to the church. He did not sell it. He leased it. We as a church are reflection and extension of the love of God to people around us. And our goal is to bring its fruit a thousand silver coin. Obviously, the number a thousand represents perfection. And we shall be the ones who are bringing people to the Lord. And it's said in Isaiah 7.23, It shall happen in that day that wherever there could be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silvers, I will be the bear, I, I will be for bearer and thorns. So here, what, what the, what's happening here, the, the Lord is responding to the prayer of the human soul, back and forth. And then he says, my own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. The Lord says, I am the owner. The vineyard is still before me. And he's saying that those who work for me will receive double portion. Those who serve with God will receive double portion. And this was uh, in one of the Gospels. And then the beloved says, You would will in the garden. The champions listen to your voice. Let me hear it. The Christ addresses us all. He says, he says, now you're no longer visibly present. He says, you who dwell in the garden, the champions listen to your voice. Let me hear it. Her voice in prayer and praise is heard all the time by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, make haste. And then the Shulamite responds. She says, make haste, my beloved and be like a gazelle or a young stud on the mountains of spice. Basically, at the very end, the human soul here is telling him, I have enjoyed your first coming. Now she's calling for the second coming to come. And you see this in the book of uh, uh, Psalms. It says, my soul awaits the Lord more than those who wait, who wait for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning overcoming all obstacles. So the book ends with the, the, the fire of love between the human soul and God, constant back and forth for the salvation of the world, and it ends with the desire of the human soul for the second coming. This is how the book of Song, Songs ends. It's almost like you do not want it to end, right? Once you started to get so intimate with God, the book cuts. And because there's no more words you can say after this, right? That's why this book, we call it the Song of Songs, or the most beautiful song, or the most beautiful prayer uh, in the Bible. So we want to uh, look at this book and learn where we're going with our spiritual life. And unfortunately, some people look at this book and try to think about it physically, and it does not add up. The Lord speaks about the human soul as a sister. She talks about other people loving him and growing with him. It does not add up. This book is the most spiritual book in the Bible. Okay? And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.